drink beer, it's good for you. Hello and welcome to the video. Within this guide I will be sharing my very tried and tested recipe and all of the steps will be explained so that you can brew a very flavourful American Imperial Stout with options depending on if you want it fast or traditional. I will also explain the different methods involved in brewing such a high ABV beer that will work within the limitations of your brewing system and beyond through to fermentation. This will then finish with a look at the final beer along with my tasting notes. Whichever way you go with this it works out really well, so let's get started. Let's now move on to the first steps with a sneak preview of my recipe's vital statistics. This recipe offers an estimated 10% ABV beer, which could be tuned down some in alcohol if you wish, just make sure you keep the same BUGU ratio, which is 0.69 as you can see here. This will not work very well for ABV levels lower than 6% though in my opinion, and it has to be said that the 10% version is where the real sweet spot is for this recipe in terms of its best flavour. The recipe predictions shown here in regards to final gravity are based on the fast method and the yeast used for this. If you decide to go for the traditional method then this is likely to change if you use a different type of yeast of course. More on these options later. For the very best of results and so that you are actually brewing the recipe as intended, I strongly suggest that your initial steps will be to convert the recipe before ordering in your ingredients, as your ingredients will be likely to be a little different to mine due to the nature of grain and hops. I have an easy guide to doing this with Brewfather on my channel as shown on screen now which will walk you through all manner of different conversion steps. Within this video this recipe is being brewed using a Gen 4 Brusilla 65 to the volume of 21 litres or approximately 5.55 US liquid gallons. But as part of the conversion process this can be scaled and shaped to suit your own brewing system and volume requirements. Do be sure though to watch this video in full for advice in regard to the volume for this recipe. I also strongly recommend that you plan your water profile ahead as it really is the only effective way. You may wish to skip this if you are a new beginner but this is for sure an important direction to move into as soon as you can. For this recipe I recommend using the Dublin water profile as shown on screen now from Brewfather. This will keep the acid to alkalinity balance correct for this recipe and will assist in keeping your mash pH in the range of between 5.2 to 5.5 which is where a stout mash should be for the best results. This is not to say that this Dublin profile is the only way for this style, there are other fine profiles out there, but do keep in mind that when developing this recipe I use the Dublin profile exclusively. Let's now move on to the brew starting with the mash. When it comes to mashing this recipe there are various choices due to the much larger grain bit involved here when compared to a regular beer style, which are dependent on the size of your brewing system and intended batch volume. For a 21 litre final batch into your fermenter then firstly like me you could use a larger brewing system. For me this is a 65 litre system in this case, and simply do one mash and add in some stirring to help it along the way to a good level of efficiency, alongside the use of your brewing system's pump. However, if you were to do the same on a smaller brewing system like a 30 or a 35 litre system, then you are very likely to run into issues with space and efficiency unless you are prepared to add in a fair amount of maintenance in terms of careful stirring during the mash, but trust me it will be a challenge due to the space you will have. In the past on this channel I released a video about this method using the Brutal's 40 litre as shown on screen, which I entitled the American Imperial Stout Challenge. This was a challenge even on a larger 40 litre system, let alone a 30 or a 35, so do be warned. One way around this is to use the reiterated mashing method that involves you splitting the grain bill in two and performing two mashes, but this will also be best done with a smaller batch size than 21 litres, again due to space constraints. For much more detail on this method check out this guide shown on screen now from my channel, which I made some years back for Grainfather G30 users. Even if you do not use a G30, most of it will apply to you if you have a similar smaller brewing system. Let's now start the mash and while you watch my mash I will explain the grain bill design and effects for this recipe. Our main fermentable here is Maris Otter which is essentially a special pal malt and as such can be subbed by others like Olden Promise. I strongly suggest such a malt because this recipe is very much a malt forward one and will certainly benefit from a more flavourful base malt. Maris Otter also benefits from having a nice background of nutty flavouring which helps this grain bill sing. At 10% we have Caramel Munich 2 which really offers a nice boost of caramel flavour along with almond and some bready qualities. This will also add a new level of toasty flavour too. 
Then at 7% we have flaked oats, which I have used to increase body and texture mostly, but they're also helpful for head retention as well. At 5% of our grist we have my favourite dehus chocolate malt, which will add in coffee, chocolate and a nice deep colour without adding in any astringency whatsoever. Our roasted barley, also at 5%, is essentially at the heart of what makes a stout a stout. It will contribute that classic roasted and perhaps burnt coffee effect along with extra colour. If you especially like this effect, then feel free to go with 7% and reduce your Maris Otter down by 2%. I do, however, feel that 5% is the sweet spot for most people for this recipe. Here is a look at this recipe's mash schedule. I am using a higher mash in temperature for this recipe because I want it to finish with a higher level of unfermentable sugars in keeping with the style. After mash out was completed I raised the Brazilla's malt pipe and set the system's temperature to a point just before boiling temperature. This allows me to start the heating process quickly and when I am ready for the boil I will move the temperature up to the final heating stage. Once enough liquid has passed down I started my spark which was done manually with a jug being careful to cover the entire plate and not letting the water level rise too far above the plate. Once at the boil this beautiful protein head had formed on top and it felt a shame to actually remove it but this is an important step to avoid a boil over. This is all stirred in so that it drops down and amalgamates with the rest of the trout but naturally the actual protein is kept within the beer where it belongs. Let's now look at the boil schedule. In keeping with the modern boil time here, I am boiling for just 30 minutes. Not only does this save some time, it also keeps more flavour within your final beer due to the reduction in boil off. For more information about the 30 minute boil, check out the video now shown on screen, which explains why boil times were longer going back in history, and why they can be much shorter these days and the benefits. For this recipe there is the need for just one single hop addition which is simply there to balance the alcohol and the bitterness. Worry is an awesome American hop for bittering which is clean and smooth. With this hop if you have a very keen nose you may pick up a slight citrus note within some recipes but the strong malty flavours within this one will certainly hide it. I also highly recommend the use of yeast nutrients within your boil which should be used within the recommendations of the manufacturer. However it is best advised to triple this amount if using fake yeast. It was then time to cool, transfer and pitch. So I called my wort down to yeast pitching temperatures and started transfer. For this recipe I'm personally using Vosk Fake and I'm using Yellowman's dry version. This yeast can be obtained in various different commercial forms as well as the multi-strain version from Norway which comes originally from the farms. There are other options though which I will come to shortly. If using Vos Quake, I recommend a fermentation temperature of 35 degrees Celsius, or certainly as close as you can get. There is no need for pressure, but if you do, then the fermentation time will increase in speed. However, even without pressure, I had a complete fermentation within 24 hours for this particular batch. Yours may take a day or so more, but yeast health is key here, as well as a triple dose of yeast nutrient. Certainly other types of cake could be used here, I simply prefer Voss for this type of recipe personally. If you cannot obtain cake, then I would suggest trying another type of yeast that can handle this level of alcohol. Fermentis US05, Laubru Bri RY97 or Mangrove Jacks M44 are all ideal for this recipe in that they are nice and neutral as well as being able to handle the higher alcohol. Do note that not only will a Kvek fermentation be a lot faster though, but Kvek will also condition this beer to a very drinkable state within 4-6 to six weeks, whereas regular yeast will deliver a similar result in around 3-4 to four months as a minimum, but often it's going to take longer. All of these types of yeast can handle pressure including fake and this is recommended at between 10 to 12 psi but with a maximum of 14.5 psi or one bar of pressure. Certainly some yeast types will be fine with more but the yeast industry is united in this being the safest level of pressure for consistently good results. People sometimes say that they have never had a problem at higher levels of pressure but frankly you will probably get away with walking across a road blindfolded until one day your bad idea caught up with you. By increasing your pressure you are stressing your yeast and not really gaining anything that is worth the gamble as the time difference will be very small. Let's now look at this resulting beer from the brew along with my tasting notes starting with a close up look at the pour and then the same pour with a focus on the full glass. As you can see this beer is actually a beautiful dark brown on the pour but a deep black in bulk in the glass with a light brown head. This beer has been in the keg for almost four weeks now and from my previous experiences of this recipe I do not expect it to change much more but it will get a little cleaner perhaps in the next two weeks. Such is the effect of Quake yeast. 
This beer has been under 12 psi of pressure, which is 0.83 bars for this time, and I'm also using this pressure for serving too. This is being served conventionally using CO2 in a standard tap, rather than nitro or a stout spout, but naturally these are options available that you can decide on yourself. Personally, I do not use nitro these days, but do enjoy the difference of a stout spout. I just have not connected it to this tap as yet, but I will intend to. So here are my toasting notes, starting with aroma. In terms of aroma, in the forefront there is a mixture of chocolate and coffee with an underlying caramel sweetness backing each aroma. There is no alcohol at all to be detected. In terms of flavour on entry, you will notice silky texture that has some warmth and some richness. The flavour journey here is a mixed one that has coffee and chocolate first that are backed up with a roasted quality. As you go further down the glass, you will also discover some bready and toasty flavouring along with dark fruit and caramel. This is by no means a dry beer, but it's not necessarily very sweet either. This bitterness and sweetness balance was where the real work was, I dare say, in perfecting this recipe. Getting the right texture level was also something that took some attempts too. This recipe is sharing similar traits to the American Imperial Stout recipe I presented on YouTube two years ago, but with a total recipe rewrite and retuning to make it more acceptable to the crowd. If you compare the two recipes, you will see quite a large change in grain bill and hop schedule, as well as a tweak down in the BUGU ratio. There is also 1% less alcohol in this new version. Too. My final impression is that this is still a big and bold American Imperial Stout that will draw you in with its silky texture and changing flavours, but it is less hardcore and more pleasing to the masses than the previous offering in 2020. I am very happy with both recipes personally, but for different reasons. I would love to hear your review within the comments section of this video and by all means tell me which of these two you personally prefer and why. Remember there are always different routes to go with beer recipes and sometimes it is great to literally consider your own taste exclusively when developing a recipe, but a crowd pleaser is often a greater challenge for when you are ready and willing for it. I do hope that you found this video useful, informative and interesting. If so, why not consider liking and subscribing? For further support you can join the channel's Facebook group, and if you would like to support the channel then check out the channel's merchandise store, as all profits go back into the channel. Until next time, happy brewing!